For our final presentation, we are thrilled to have our workshop led by Aviv Ben Ari. Aviv is a data scientist manager at Intuit and was previously a lead data scientist at PayPal. She specializes in fraud prevention and cybersecurity, and in the past worked at the prime minister's office in the cybersecurity field. She studied computer science and life science at Tel Aviv University and continues to collaborate with Tel Aviv University on her research in explainable AI. Thank you again, and please welcome Aviv. Thank you very much. Okay, so before we begin, um, I would like to share that the work I'm going to present today is part of the university collaboration program between Intuit and Tel Aviv University. And uh, the, the um, research I'm going to talk about is currently not implemented within Intuit products. So let's start our talk with a simple example. Meet Amy. Amy is a product marketing manager responsible for acquiring, maintaining, and growing her company's user base. Amy loves data and she works very closely with her data science team to gain insights, insights about users and how she can maintain them better. So Amy tried to understand why a specific customer of hers, let's call her Sarah, was ranked as very likely to churn by one of the data science models. Amy approached the data science team to ask why and they responded that their black box model said that Sarah probably feels the product is a bit too expensive for her. A bit worried, Amy asked, how did the model come to this conclusion? She wanted to really understand the model, the model prediction. As a data scientist that is very passionate, passionate about explainable AI, I set out on the journey to help find Amy a better answer and help her make sure that Sarah remains a happy customer. I started by investigating which explanation method the data science team was currently using. So maybe they were using genie importance. Genie importance is a popular method used to explain um, the importance of features in tree-based models such as random forest and XGBoost. Genie is based on uh, the total decrease in node impurity. Um, let's take a look at the figures below. So a low Gini index would mean that um, the items in a bag or a specific node um, are pretty similar. Uh, the impurity is low. Whereas a high Gini index means that the classes of the instances within the node are very different. So we test the decrease in this node impurity and we weight it by the probability of reaching that node in the tree. And if we're using an ensemble of trees, we average uh, this information over all of the trees in the ensemble. This is a global explanation method, meaning it ranks the, the features once per model, stating which features are more important. But some data scientists tend to use it as a local explanation method, meaning if they, dis they find the top three features in the model, they would keep using these three features in order to ex explain every single model decision. I talked about this, uh, this method and my concerns with my colleague Yair. Um, I collaborate with him in the university collaboration program. And I was actually worried that because of that the data scientists on the team are not aware of the high bias towards continuous features. If this is the case, this, this can be the reason why cost, which is very continuous, was at the top of the feature list. My colleague was worried that they may have not taken care of correlated features within the model, and this also can blur results for genie importance. After giving it a second thought, I thought that they probably must be using SHAP. SHAP is a newer explanation method. Um, it is, uh, came out in um, 2016 and has been widely adopted in the last years. Um, as it has a super convenient Python package, um, and it, it also satisfies multiple mathematical axioms. So SHAP stands for Shapely Additive Explanations. Shapely values were actually invented by uh, Lloyd Shapley, which was an economist, not a data scientist, in the 1950s. And this method was borrowed to explain machine learning models around five years ago. The notion that the SHAP is based on is trying to find the marginal contribution of each feature to the final model decision. Let's take a look at, this, at it more intuitively. So say we have a model that predicts the price of, uh, of apartments, and this is based on four features. If the apartment is close to a park, 
uh, how big the apartment is, which floor it's at, and if the building the apartment is at allows pets or not. So say we have two subsets of, subsets of features, two inputs. For one, the model predicts a price of 310K, and for the, other, for, the, for the second instance, 320K. So if I would ask you what the marginal contribution of, have, of allowing pets uh, is, you would probably just take the delta and say 10K, right? But the theory behind shap values or shapely values claims that we need or proves that we need to test every single coalition or subset of features and test the marginal contribution of the single feature um, combined with, with this, with this uh, subset. So I won't go deeper into the theory. Um, this is just intuition and this is not the actual main topic of the talk, but if you would like to read more, you can Google SHAP and there's a great paper uh, which introduced the, the concept and uh, many more, much more material. So SHAP is, as I said, is currently one of the most popular explainability methods used in the industry by data scientists. And indeed, I received from the data science team a list of 100 features along with their respective shapely values, meaning the weight or the shapely value or the marginal contribution for each of the 100 model features. And indeed, I can see that fees is at the top of the list. It contributes the most towards the final prediction. And this made me feel a little bit better because as I said, I know all about the math mathematical axioms that shapely values satisfy. So that convinced me and finally I came to the conclusion that I need to tell Amy that all she needs to do is give Sarah a discount and lower her fees. And then uh, this will make Sarah be a happy customer and not churn. By how much does Sarah need to, uh, does Amy need to give Sarah a discount? This is something that Chap uh, simply can't uh, answer. So fast forward one month and Amy indeed reduced Sarah's fees by 50%, but Sarah indeed churned, although this is what Chap recommended or explained regarding the, the uh, model prediction regarding churn. And in fact, overall retention rate was lower than ever for the entire company and situation was very bad. How can that possibly be? So apparently SHAP is an additive feature attribution approach, meaning it attributes a weight or um, an importance for every feature in the model, but it does not allow for what if analysis, meaning if we change one or more features, SHAP doesn't allow us to understand what will happen to the model prediction. And this is exactly what happened. We changed one of the features, the fees, and the result was unexpected. So I hope you understand why being able to explain uh, model predictions is important, but let's try to think what should a good model, uh, model explanation provide. Um, and this slide is based on a paper from 2017, which we'll revisit later on. So this paper claims that there are two important aspects. One is to inform and help the explainee, which can be the data scientist, the analyst, the marketing uh, person, uh, and so on. Um, understand why a particular decision was reached, or in our case, why did the model uh, say that um, Sarah is very high, highly likely to churn? And the second aspect is that uh, the user needs to be able to understand what can be changed in order to receive a desired result. Meaning, in the, our case, what would what does Amy need to change for Sarah? What does Sarah need to change in order for the model to predict that she will not churn? And this is based on the same decision-making model. So the first, the information part, as, you, as we saw before, can be completely satisfied by SHAP and also uh, other methods I didn't talk about, for example, LIME. But we want to be able to answer both. And apparently both are satisfiable using a method called counterfactual explanations, which is the main topic for our talk today. So what are counterfactual explanations? Formally, a counterfactual explanation explains a prediction by presenting a maximally close alternative input that would have resulted in a different, usually desired prediction. Let's take a look at a graphic example um, from a package I'll mention later on in the talk called DICE by Microsoft. So in this example, we have a, a loan approval model. The dots in blue represent the original class, which is the people that um, got re rejected uh, for a loan by the model. The gray line here is the model's decision boundary, and the orange dots are the uh, users that received uh, the, the desired class, which is the uh, loan approved by the model. So let's take a look at one specific instance, the dot um, colored in light blue, and we would like to uh, find a counterfactual explanation for this dot. So what do we need to do? We need to look for 
um, a, a maximally close alternative, meaning an orange dot, uh, that's closest that, that would, would have resulted in a different prediction, meaning the orange dot is over the de model decision boundary. And we indeed found this specific orange dot. And this orange dot is actually the counterfactual explanations. And what we can do now is compare the features of the original instance to the, the, those of the orange dot and understand what needs to be change, changed in order to flip the model decision. So after we understood intuitively what counterfactuals are, let's try to think what would make a great counterfactual. So a great counterfactual would have changes that are limited to a small subset of features. Several papers show that in order to make explanations uh, comprehensible to humans, it, they need to be very compact, meaning to um, have only a very small subset of affected features. As we want the counterfactual to be close to the original instance, we also need, that, need to make sure that the changes per feature are relatively small. It's not enough to have small changes or close counterfactuals. We also need them to be feasible and actionable, meaning we can't uh, offer a change, which means that age decreases. And as data scientists, we would also like the counterfactual output to be standardized, and we'd like to be able to aggregate over counterfactuals because a counterfactual for a single instance is a great local explanation. But if we would like to globally un understand how our model works, we would like to generate multiple counterfactuals for multiple instances and be able to aggregate over them all. So who's the target audience for counterfactual explanations? Because these explanations are so intuitive, the audience is actually very wide, as opposed to SHAP and other complex uh, solutions for explainability that I talked about before. So a data scientist like myself may want to use SHAP, may want to use, sorry, counterfactuals in order to get a sense of what the decision landscape looks like. A policy maker, maker, which is a person usually in charge of translating model scores into actions within the product, may want to understand the model's false positives. And an end customer may want to understand, in some scenarios, the decision and what can be done to alter it. So now that we understand what counterfactuals are, hopefully are convinced why they're useful, see that they're intuitive and anyone can read them, let's get a bit more technical and understand how to generate them. So generating counterfactuals is apparently not, tri not a trivial task. We would like the optimal counterfactual generator to be quick, efficient, and mathematically sound. We would like it to account for feasibility and actionability. As I said before, it needs to understand that it can't generate a counterfactual, which would mean a person would need to decrease his age. And it optimally would infer restrictions from the actual data without having the user input the restrictions for every single feature, be able to handle missing values, and also categorical data. If we're able to obtain all of, all of these criteria, then this would probably be the optimal counterfactual generator. But this is very, very hard to achieve. So if it's so difficult to generate counterfactuals synthetically, why don't we just select them from the existing instances, the existing data? So for some use cases, exposing other users' real data may not really be acceptable. For example, if we're dealing with financial data or health-related data, uh, medical data, this isn't something that we would like to do. Also, not every instance in the data has a close neighbor. It depends on the size and the distribution of the data set. And if the classes are highly imbalanced, this problem is even worse because the chances are that the chances are uh, very low that we'll find um, another instance existing in the data that's from the opposite class and is also relatively close. So this isn't a very good option. And we're going back to our, our uh, initial plan of generating counterfactuals uh, synthetically and not selecting from the existing instance. So how can we generate counterfactuals synthetically? Um, a, a, the, the same paper I talked about before from 2017 was the first paper to introduce counterfactuals as a way to explain model decisions. Counterfactuals is a concept that has existed for a while now. Um, but it was never used to explain model decisions until uh, this, this paper, which is great and I recommend, came out. So they took a very simple approach, uh, which is very common in machine learning, which is minimizing a loss function. The loss function they introduced is very simple. The first term is the distance between the model prediction for the counterfactual and the desired outcome. For example, if I would like to obtain a score, a model score of 0.8, and the counterfactual gives me a score of 0.6, uh, 
then the delta 0.2 is taken into account and squared. This is the distance between the counterfactual score and the score that I would like to achieve. The second term is the distance between the original input and the counterfactual. Here we speak about the actual features of the counterfactual versus the features of the original input. And a third term balances the difference in prediction against the distance in the feature values. We can use any optimizer um, we like to, uh, to do the optimization, and we derive um, the, uh, the best counterfactual. And note that we did this without requiring the model itself, only the input and the model predictions for the counterfactual and the original instance, which is very good. However, this generates only one counterfactual. What if? There are many possible counterfactuals for a specific instance, and this is indeed the case. For every original instance, we can usually generate multiple, even 10, 20 counterfactuals. And indeed, a package called DICE, Diverse Counterfactual Explanations, was published by Microsoft two years ago. And it uses a different generation method, not the uh, loss function optimization one. It's called DPP, Determinantal Point Process. And this method allows the user to select the counterfactual most convenient for them from a large array of counterfactuals generated. This counterfactual diversity also allows for interesting insight extraction for data scientists and analysts. One example is to check which features always tend to change despite the diversity, right? If we generate 10 counterfactuals for an instance and we notice that there's one single feature that always needs to change or never changes, this means a lot on the importance and the behavior of that feature. We can all also check the court, the, which features all, always tend to change together and so on. So back to my churn example to Sarah and Amy. DICE offered Amy a few things she can do in order to make Sarah uh, or make the model predict that Sarah will not churn. The first is to translate the site to Sarah's preferred language, which apparently isn't English. The second is to persuade Sarah to log into the site every single day. And the third is to reduce Sarah's fee to minus 3%. So if we take a look at these counterfactual options, the first is actually something that can easy, easily be done. The second is possible, but it's very, very hard to achieve. And the third isn't even feasible. So now the next step after we learn how to generate counterfactuals, generate multiple count, diverse counterfactuals, is to address this problem, the problem of feasibility. Luckily, the same year, another paper was published called Feasible and Actionable Counterfactual Explanations, or FACE for short. And FACE introduces a novel concept, which I'll explain through this image on the left. So the original instance I would like to explain is the X um, on the left. And the blue, blue dots all were predicted class zero by the model. The red area represents um, the, the second class, the second uh, model prediction class, class one. And we would like to find an alternative um, input, some, some um, instance or dot on, on the red area, which is close to X. And the trivial option would be selecting A, right? A, A is very close and it, it received the, op the opposite model prediction class. But the authors say it's too close to the decision boundary, the white line, and therefore it's not a very robust option. So let's move to point B. Point B is further into the red area, which means it may be a safer choice, although it's uh, more distant. But they say that because the area B is in is very sparse, meaning B is not close to any real instance in the data, this is also a bad choice. So let's move to C. C is in a dense area, which seems better, but we can see that the path between X and C is, the, is sparse. They actually say that the best option is D. We can see that for D, every step of the way on the path between X and D is dense. And apparently these dense paths um, give a very high probability of the way or the, the path between X and D to also be feasible because the path passes through real uh, instances or real users. Um, so what they do is they weigh the density with the distance and derive a short, relatively short path, but that is also dense. And this makes the, um, ex the counterfactual uh, more likely to be uh, feasible. So I think this is a very cool algorithm. So we understand how to generate counterfactuals, how to make them diverse, how to make them feasible. 
I'm sure you're all excited to go ahead and generate counterfactuals for your own model. But apparently, most of the recent advancements in the field I showed, they're all from the past three to, three to five years, were never translated to user-friendly Python packages. And those that were translated, for example, DICE or Alibi, which I didn't show today, have completely different input requirements each, meaning you need to learn how to use each one separately. It's also very hard to compare them. Each has different restrictions, issues, and output formats. And this makes this not so user-friendly. Specifically, I tested DICE on my real-world use cases, and I found numerous showstoppers, which made me not be able to use it. For 25% 25 25 of my false positives, the, the package never converged, meaning I never got an explanation. Their missing, um, uh, missing values are not handled. And as I use XGBoost, I have a lot of missing values in my data and many more. So how can this be fixed? Well, I attribute a great deal of SHAP's uh, success to its incredibly user-friendly Python package. I'm sure a lot of you know the package. It has a lot of stars and forks. And with just a few lines of code, without understanding how SHAP actually works, I can get very good explanations and even very good charts. So we thought, what if we had a framework for counterfactual generation and analysis, which works with many different algorithms and is very simple to query. Some examples of good, good frameworks that we use every day include PyTorch, TensorFlow, NumPy. And we thought maybe we can generate something as popular as, this, as these packages. And indeed, as part of the university collaboration program, myself, together with Dr. Yair Choresh from Intuit, Idan Meyuchas, and Professor Daniel Deutsch from Tel Aviv University, we created a framework called CFDB, which is a machine learning model analysis framework via a database, databases of counterfactuals. And the paper we wrote um, uh, describing this framework was accepted to ACM SIGMOD uh, of this year. So our system is actually based on SQL, which is a language that both data scientists and analysts tend to use and know very well, and is also very simple. We parse queries, which I'll show in the next slides, written by the user. We take the input data, and we're able to use a, a wide array of counterfactual generators without actually exposing their inner workings to the end user. For the user, it's a black box. All the user needs to say is which counterfactual generator he or she would like to use. We then use uh, databases to optimize and store the counterfactuals generated. This has a lot of uh, very good implications. We can optimize the queries and can use caching and so on. And then the user receives the counterfactuals and is again able to use SQL, which is very simple, in order to query the counterfactuals and gain insights into his or her data. So this is currently still work in progress. We're going to publish an open source package, hopefully, um, in the near future, but I would like to demonstrate how easy it is to use our system. So first, with just a simple line of code, we load our data, the instances we would like to explain, and our model or models. Then using, again, a, a simple SQL query, we select the in instances of interest. In my example, I would like to only query the model's false positives, not all the input I provided. I then can select the counterfactual generator, in my, op my, my uh, case, DICE, diverse counterfactuals. And again, using SQL, once I get the counterfactuals, I can then analyze them. Then I execute my query. And using simple Python, I can create a chart. In this case, I rank the feature importance across three different classifiers, only for the data's false positives across three different features. This is a very complicated analysis. And I did all of this with around 20 lines of Python and SQL code. Um, okay, so now that we talked a bit about uh, how we want to solve this technical problem, we also understand that there is much more to explore on the more um, theoretical aspects of counterfactuals as well. There are many open questions that our research group, as well as others, are currently exploring, but all these questions remain open. The first is how can we measure if a counterfactual is good? This is an open question in explainability in general. Um, finding a single metric to uh, classify an explanation as good is very difficult. Another question is can a counterfactual be, always be generated for every single instance? As I said before, there are some packages where we, the, issue, the problem never, con the counterfactual generator never converges. Why does this happen? 
what can we learn from tracking counterfactuals over time? In a lot of real world industry scenarios, we retrain our models every single day, week or month. And we think that using counterfactuals, we can identify changes in the data and also changes in what the, the retrained model learns over time. And the final question, which I personally find the most interesting, is can model robustness be estimated using counterfactual diversity? Let's go back to an example I already shared before. If we have 10 counterfactuals for a specific instance explaining it, and we see that in all 10 counterfactuals, changing a single feature can flip the model decision. This can mean that the model is not very robust because an adversary uh, attacker may easily identify a, the single point of failure, change the feature, and be able to bypass the model every single time. So now that you know all about counterfactuals, I hope that you would like to join me in exploring this fascinating and relatively new field. You can run the packages I mentioned before and more over your own data. As I said before, there are some drawbacks, but I'm sure that most of you can find, them, find the packages very useful. You can contribute to open source, uh, fixing and enhancing these packages. Um, for example, DICE, which I talked about before, is completely open source, and we also plan to open source our package. And you can um, also join, uh, join me on academic research, even if you're part of the industry. Uh, my full-time job is that into it. And still, I, uh, can't, I, part of, part of my, my, as part of my job, I, can't, uh, I collaborate with uh, the university. And this is uh, amazing and a great opportunity into it uh, provides us. So hopefully, if everything works out, someday we will be able to fully and intuitively understand our model decisions. Thank you.